<laughs> Dr. Slackler believed that there was a link between science and art. And if the lay public understood the three R's that I'm going to talk about today, radiation, reactors, and residuals, I think the judgment would be a little bit more positive there would be more trust. So let me present a little bit of the details. So when we talk about radiation, we live in a sea of radiation on this place that we call Earth. And it's because we have elements above element number 83, bismuth, all of those, starting with polonium, are naturally radioactive. And that environment has been here since the beginning of time and will be here a long, long time since when we were gone. So that means that we developed on this Earth with a safe threshold of radiation, that we will thrive with a safe threshold of radiation. However, our regulations are based on a linear no threshold theory, and so let me put that in perspective. We use a very simplistic model that we learned in algebra called a line, y equals mx plus b. We knew that Newton had to invent a new form of mathematics called calculus to understand how an apple fell off a tree. So why do we use the most simplistic mathematical model to model radiation exposure for humans? Let me switch to the next one, reactors. Humans harness, harness chemical ener energy, which we call fire. We harness that energy of fire long before we really understood it because we still have, at the company I work for today, still studying how to improve the combustion in jet engines or in gas turbines. <laughs> And so when we look at fire, it deals with this outer shell electrons of atoms. So my other panelists up here will talk about geotechnology, um, nanotechnology, and biotechnology. All of that deals with the outer shell electrons of atoms. So let me put it in perspective. If this water bottle was the nucleus of an atom, you pick it, the electrons would be six to seven miles away. So when we talk about the binding energy of an atom, that's the world that I live in with this nucleus, where instead of electrons that are one to two electron volts, the binding energy of an atom are hundreds of millions of electron volts. So what does that give us? 104 reactors today run in the United States that provide 20% of our electricity to this nation, that base load electricity. So to put that in perspective on Friday was a big day because you or uh, Facebook went public. Right? Imagine that technology trying to go public in a grid that was up and down, that was cyclic, that one set of servers got to run for a couple of days and another set of servers for another company got to run. It wouldn't work. Facebook relies on that base of electricity for instantaneous communications. So let me go to the last R, and that's residuals. Some people call it toxic waste. It's, the legal name is called spent fuel. Some people call it used fuel. Is it really an asset? And that's the, di the dichotomy of nuclear waste. Is it, is it a waste or an asset? Should we take action now or should we delay that action? So President Obama established the Blue Ribbon Commission, which was a collection of 17 very talented Americans. And when you look at their report, they will say that there is no technology that's available today 
and that we need to wait yet again before we take that solution on. However, in this building, the National Academy of Sciences is very clear on at least 10 studies that looked at what you do with waste. They said put it in a geological repository. That's consistent with the Russian National Academy of Sciences, Canadian National Academy of Sciences, but yet we as a society still grapple with that sort of decision to do that. To put that in perspective, if we took all of the used nuclear fuel today with technology that was developed at our national laboratories, it would supply 100% of our electricity for 100 years. So to me, that looks like an asset. So let me end this session or my time with the science of sewage. It's a quick story, because sewage stinks and we didn't understand it as well. And so in the 1860s, when this country was grappling with the Civil War, there was another place called London that was the most densely populated city of the world. And what did they, the technology was, what do we do with sewage? So the first approach was outhouses that was contaminating the wells. Then they went to cesspools that people had to pump out, but it cost money, so they didn't do that. So they put in a drainage ditch that drained it in, into the Thames River, and that turned it into the largest cesspool in the world because the Thames River was a tidal river with very little flow. And so it was because of the stink at Parliament that the politicians finally took action. Mm -hmm. Joseph Balgaziati was the civil engineer that constructed this thing called a sewer system that we're very familiar with that drained it, that settled the solid out. Those solids got put to sea. They've since stopped that. They incinerate them. And that big radical technology that he used that day was to use Portland cement other than Roman cement. And those structures, that infrastructure works today. That science is understood. So when I look at nuclear technology 100 years hence, I think we'll have the same sort of perspective. So it's a matter of perspective. It's that matter of how we communicate that perspective. Dr. Slachter said that he believed that art and science were connected, and that's why I started out with some art today. So effectively advocating Nuclear science and technology requires that skillful, artful sort of communications because art moves people, beautiful science moves people, and if it's not we the scientists, then who?